Okay, so thank you so much, uh, distinguished ladies and the gentlemen. So my name is uh, BBC. Okay, okay, are we having a conversation with you on building a new Africa with AI and blockchain? So uh, our conversation will focus on building a new Africa with AI and blockchain. And for those to begin that, I take you back to the beginning. Uh, the beginning was actually one of the finest moments where the Greek philosophers were trying to explain the material component of the universe and the great debate. In that great debate, they asked this question, what is our world made up of? What is the main component of the universe? And so many of them had postulations. I tell say that the world was mirror water. Heroclitus said the world is mirror fire. But I would like to zero in in what Pythagoras said. Pythagoras postulated that the world is nothing but numbers. And if the world is nothing but numbers, the implication is that everything we do on earth is nothing but numbers. The business of medicine, the business of economic development, the business of banking, across all human domains, industry sector, sectors, industrial sectors, and everything we do, we can all see everything from numbers. Of course, we know the guy called Pythagoras, the guy that gave us the Pythagoras theory, and the right angle triangle, if you take the individual squares, the opposite and adjacent, you get the square hypotenuse. In other words, for him, everything is nothing but numbers. In other words, if you understand the numbers of your business, the propensity for you to do better will also improve. If you understand the numbers around your state, the ability to fix the challenges in that state will also accelerate. If you understand the numbers of your nation, you have a better chance of facing the problems in that nation. So anything we do, if we see the world as nothing but numbers, it means that we are actually going to depend on those numbers to actually fix whatever paralysis that we see before us. So the extrapolation here from those hypotheses that the Greek philosophers have given us is this, that any time we are making a decision without numbers, we are involved simply in a guesswork. Because the numbers of your businesses, the numbers of your customers, the numbers of economic development systems, they are going to give you the vista upon which you can actually come up with the right solutions to fix whatever problems or challenges that you have. When we say numbers, we're actually talking about data. When we say numbers, we're talking about the zeros and ones that make up the computer systems that we use today. So there is something so fanciful and something so fascinating. To build a new Africa, we need to have a deeper understanding of the numbers around Africa. If we do not have a deeper understanding of the numbers around Africa, it's going to make it extremely very difficult for us to have the capacity to go in and face the challenges that we have in the continent. And of course, as we walk deeper to understand the numbers around the continent, we also need to have trust in how these numbers are interleaved and interwoven, connecting all the elemental constructs that define our existence as a people, from the people to the stakes and to industries. So we need to have the numbers, we need to understand the numbers, and we need to trust these numbers. Interestingly, technology systems have become vanguards to help us to have the capacity to understand those numbers. If you go back to the old time, when they began those constructs of understanding many elemental systems in mathematics. Remember mathematics, the science of numbers. I remember it many, many years ago in secondary school when they introduced us to the whole constructs of understand the natural philosophy when they were introducing physics in SS1. 
And from that, we move from natural philosophy, moving into mathematics, the science of numbers, getting into university to see a deeper understanding of things that actually drive the constructs of a natural philosophy. The fact is this, better understanding of numbers, higher trust in those numbers, you begin to see a new continent image. Why? The ability to organize the factors of production, your land, your labor, your capital, entrepreneurial capitalism and knowledge will not be efficiently done until you understand the numbers that work in your economic system or work in your company. So our ability to have these knowledge systems will actually be dependent on how we can build the necessary structures around the numbers in our economies. There is a technology they call artificial intelligence today, giving machines capabilities that they will begin to actually think within the domain of human systems. What is happening here is that these machines can now assume intelligence that you have not even built into them, and that's why that intelligence become artificial. And what they are trying to do here is that they actually help you to understand things which you may not have even understood because they have scale like capacity, have processing computational power that they can do things better than most of us can do as humans. If you deploy such, you get more clarity in your market systems. And when you get clarity in your market system, beautiful things begin to happen. You see more visibility in how you can approach it, the, the, the system. You go back to the old time of Abacus. You go back to the time they invented the difference engine. You go back to the ENIAC and ENIAC and the time they invented transistor by Shockley and the time they invented integrated circuit by John Dow Kibi. One of the things we have been trying to do as human is having the capacity, how do we process and manipulate numbers? Because if everything we do on earth is based on numbers, the business of humanity now is how do we make sense of numbers? How do we process numbers? Because out of these numbers that we can see the future that we want to create. The best way to predict the future is to create it. And how do you create what you don't understand? How do you build a new Africa if you cannot make sense of Africa of today? We need to have the understanding of these numbers. And then as those numbers, we try to understand them, the trust in the system becomes extremely critical. And that's where these blockchain systems, building these general public ledgers, building trust that when we say it is one plus one, Two is one plus one, two. No one can now go and introduce false factors causing problems in this system. Our communities, our nations, and our continent, we have a huge obligation to build trusted data systems upon which people can use to make decisions on how they allocate factors of production. How do I build a new factory in Kaduna? How do I build a new company in Oweri? How do I open up a shop in Nairobi? Is the data I'm using, is that data reliable? How do I make sure that as I'm raising that capital, combining and recombining factors of production, that all the constructs and hypotheses and basing everything that those things make sense? As we know one thing, Africa will only rise to the mountain top when we have the capacity to fix frictions which are evident in our community. Frictions are the challenges that we have. We don't have good clean water systems. We don't have electricity. We don't have challenge other things. But how do we fix them? We need to fix them when we begin to apply these five factors. And applying these five factors mean that we're, we need to understand the numbers that run. If you look into our continent today, there's so many untapped opportunities. We remain a subcontinent, just around two, three, four trillion dollars economy, three. But if you look at it critically, Africa should be somewhere around 10 trillion GDP because we are more than 
a billion people. And we have the natural resource, we have the talent, we have the young people, we have people that are well trained, educated. So that extrapolation means that if we can deploy this insight through numbers using these AI systems and blockchain in agriculture, in our healthcare system, in our real estate, in education, and other domains of our industrial sectors, we have the capacity to actually pull this economy and run it into an exponential growth that we can find a glory at the end of the tunnel. And one thing that we can do that is simple to bring prosperity in the continent is what I have called the digital asset register. Just imagine for a minute, you go back to your village in any part of Africa and you see men and women with acres of land through hereditary, they have inherited these from the ancestors. Yet yeah, these are people that are extremely poor because that piece of land to a large extent has no mobility, has, has no velocity. In other words, they cannot sell that piece of land in order for them to actually improve their lives. Then you see a man who has 100 hectares of land being classified as being poor. How does that make sense? He has 100 hectares of land and he is still considered as being poor because he is not anywhere in the balance sheet of Nigeria. He's not anywhere in the balance sheet of Africa because that piece of land has not entered any balance sheet. That means he cannot use it to earn income. He cannot take maybe five acres to go and sell it, get that money to send the children to school or go to the hospital if there is any uh, a health issue in the family. So imagine if we bring this blockchain technology to make it possible that we can efficiently organize all farmlands in the beautiful continent and now make it possible instead of that man being considered poor, he can sell 10 acres. By selling the 10 acres, it makes it possible that he will have resources in order to take care of things that matter. The implication of that is that some of the banks will now begin to open offices in rural communities in Africa, not just only in the cities, because the rich among us, to a large extent, will also be those in the rural area. The reason why it's not happening today is because we have not brought out that postulation by Pythagoras making sense of the numbers of farmlands in Africa. Until we do that, to register them, to put the velocity of numbers around them, that piece of land will not have much value because people cannot buy it, people cannot resell it, people cannot buy it, people cannot resell it. AI blockchain will help you to bring the trust in the system and now improve the ability to unlock such high level opportunities. So let me also say this, that as you go through this, it's going to be that Cambrian moment for Africa because we need to move into the translation era. We have been in this moment, Obama, if, we, if you look at this curve of 2,000 years of GDP, our continent has not participated. It means our moment should come now so that that translation from where we are to the point where we desire to be, that when we are looking at the GDP plots, Africa will begin to register somewhere. And just to make sure that this is not so theoretical, people will ask, what is this AI and what is this blockchain? And I'm going to show you cases, the possibilities of what these technologies can do to shape the ordinance of market system, bring efficiency in the utilization of factors of production. And at the end of the day, we can build a continent that all of us will be very proud of. And I will say this clearly also, but even as we march on to the AI disintermediation, remember one thing, that the biggest challenge Africa will face in the next few years will be competition with AI. I made this point in a recent an article in Harvard Business Review, and also I've extended this in other publication in Harvard. What I stated there is evident that if Africa thinks that we can industrialize, and we are going to follow the pathway that China had taken. My hypothesis is that AI 
has already disintermediated or because the things which made it possible for China to rise when Western Europe and America were shipping jobs to China, AI will do most of those jobs in America. In other words, there will not even be a need for US and Western Europe to take those jobs to China because we have relied that one day China, the wages will go up. And if the wages go up in China, America will not need to send jobs to China, rather they will send them to Africa. And that is how we are going to rise. But America may not even need to send anything to anybody because the jobs that they have been sending to China, AI and robots, robots will most likely do them in the United States. And if that is the case, it means that Africa needs to come up with a new playbook on how we can industrialize because the old pathway that China has taken may not be relevant because AI will do most of the jobs that Americans would have as socks to China or to Africa. So I call on our leaders to open up our playbook. How do we rise as a people in the age of AI and blockchain? Because they are going to bring a new perturbation that can actually make it poss possible for us to pick that part. The pillars of the future with STEM education, science, physics, physics, chemistry, mathematics, of course, other things follow. When you now look at it, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, every other thing is important, but these are very critical. If we want to have the capacity to create our future so that we can predict our future. The beautiful science of numbers, math, we invest in it, and we prepare young people for the opportunities of the future. Of course, having an entrepreneurial capitalist mindset where we drive innovation, focusing on fixing frictions in market systems is also that pillar. I'll just show you cases here. If you look at this uh, technology by the left, what this tech does is that, imagine a scenario in, in Wuste market in, in, in Abuja, Nigeria, and, and people are just coming back from, 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 from work or uh, for markets. And all they need to do is to take a, a pint of blood and they just drop it on a sensor. And that's, that device tells them the kind of uh, ailment or disease or, or, or problem they're having. There is no need to have any, any medical doctor around because these are not the terrible types of diseases. So you can tell this person, oh, you have a tuberculosis, you have malaria, you have typhoid. And the, the implication here is that AI systems can improve the marginal cost. A marginal cost here means that one of these machines put in a village, put in a church, put in a mosque, can make it possible that one doctor can serve 1,000 customers, 1,000 patients. In other words, there are things that these AI systems can do to make it possible that the limited number of doctors we have we can actually use them to do more important things while the smaller things could be taken care of by technology. And, and uh, that means that once you put that pint, it takes the sample within a second, it tells you, okay, it seems like you have uh, 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 malaria. I'm 97% confidence in interval rates. So I am also going to send a prescription to you to a, a local pharmacy looking at the GPS location of where you are and go to that GIS location, pick that, and I don't know what they need to do for that malaria, you pick that drug. So, but if something now gets out of hand, the person can now be referred to a doctor. And by using AI systems in healthcare, we can advance the efficiency how we deploy our medical professionals. And this is one of the youth cases of what technology can do. And of course, and also in agriculture, you can also see a scenario where you build technology systems that take up what the crops need and what the soil is, is given. And now do a, a composite analysis, looking at so many elements at the end of the day, it tells you, hey, you don't have enough moisture in this land. Your fertilizer, NPK fertilizer, you have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. You need to go and recalibrate because in the next three, four days, if you do not apply this, the, the, the yield in this farmland is going to drop by 3%. If you don't do this in the next three weeks, the yield drop by 5%. It makes agriculture to become business instead of ancestral custodian or culture. 
where people are working hard at the end of the day, they are creating mass poverty in a land of farmers. How can farmers be asking government for food? How can farmers be asking government to bear them out for food if their job is to create food? It means that we have to bring these technology systems to advance that efficiency, how the agricultural process can work. And I also want to show you this. Imagine a scenario here. Every one or every community, you have this mobile kiosk. These are not imagination. These are products that are available, but I don't want to get into mentioning names of the products so that it doesn't look like one is coming here for advertisement. What I'm trying to say here is that when we are talking about AI and blockchain, let's not think within the mindset that these are technology people, they have come again. What happens in these products here you are looking at, somebody walks into a kiosk and you talk to a doctor. It could be in a market. It has a, 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 a it has a satellite connectivity. It has a, uh, at the end here, you can see solar. It runs on itself. And the doctor could be in America. The doctor could be in Sokoto. The doctor could be in anywhere in part of the world. And when you finish that conversation, it tells you what. And what happens here is that as that is happening, data system, blue blockchain, authenticating whatever that is happening in that particular process. And, and just a physical uh, of this device, actually. So where are we going? Where we are going is that taking a use case in Nigeria, for example, if we bring these AI systems and add what they call Internet of Things and blockchain, we have an opportunity to change many things in the country. I'm just rounding up because of time. The first one I will look at is salaries of public workers. There have been these kind of perturbations over years, ghost workers, these things are not rocket science. If we want to build a trusted system, going back to that postulation of Pythagoras, where we can use blockchain systems, we can fix all these problems of payment of salary just within, within days. So that is a huge application for us to actually move this system to a technology that gives us the opportunity that we can have zero fraud in our, in our, in our public service in payments of salary. And of course, also in custom, we make it possible that this system work through blockchain and we can remove leakage. One, one I also like that is very fascinating is fuel distribution. If we add smart sensors on our national fuel distribution system, we are going to solve some of the challenges that we have. Today, what happens here is this. People are tracking trucks and not the liquid content in the trucks. You go into a depot in Lagos, you fill up a truck, and the truck is designed to be going to Bauchi in Nigeria. What the man does, he leaves that depot, he siphons the fuel to another truck. He drives the empty truck because you are tracking the, the physical truck, not the liquid content. Imagine if you put an IoT device in that can track the liquid content in the truck, so that as the trucks are being unleashed across Nigeria, we can know the quantity liquid content and we can use a blockchain system to actually know when the filling station has received the liquid content in Bauchi, instead of giving the person the truck to Bauchi and the person is going to Benin Republic where he makes more money selling the fuel. These are little things that technology systems can be. And when we begin to do we can now improve our capacity to deal with little things. So this is the last slide. And the most fascinating part of it is what I have advocated, which I called anti-corruption too. Eliminate procurement corruption. It's one of the most fanciful and the easiest things that we can do in the country. How do we do that? Every government, federal government contracting in Nigeria today, to a large extent, is paid by Central Bank of Nigeria. If you do a contract with, with most federal agencies, the CBN, that's where you get the alert. So the interesting thing here is that whenever anything is bought, we actually, CDN has that data before it pays. I'm saying here, if we have a database, put every pay, every contract amount, put it in a database. So if somebody's buying a car and you know the amount of the car, you put it in the database, you know, when the, when it was bought, where it was bought, which agent you bought it. 
over a period of time, you can build a very massive database that if somebody is buying the same device or the same product or the same thing, and it has a, a difference of 20% from the average, you could now begin to say, hey man, we just saw that you are buying a new car. Somebody bought this car 10 million naira, but we see that you are going to buy it 19 million. Um, the system just through a database queried it, said that this is outside the delta of where we can allow to go through. So before the Central Bank of Nigeria will pay this particular contractor, will you be open for us to call the guy that supplied the last company the same car at 10 million instead of this 19 million that you are asking them to supply? Your own, and you save your 9 million. So we just ask him. So if the, if the DG now says, no, you know, there is now a problem. But what do we do today in Nigeria? We allow that procurement of 19 million to go through. Then the next day, EFCC and the ICPC will now begin to go and prosecute that DG, spending hopefully, possibly a straight five, five, six, ten years or whatever to now recover the 9 million. When, if we have invested in prevention, we could have actually stopped that nine, that extra nine million being wasted. So blockchain and using data systems, putting intelligence in data system can help us query all federal procurement, making sure that the variance between one man buying pencil, one naira, another person buying the same pencil, five naira, that we can reduce it. We simply means that we have to standardize how the bidding process is so that we can compare apple with apple, orange with orange. I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it does not require us to go to the moon to get men and women that can do this. This is what graduate students, if you just pick them from ABU, UNN, and UI, and say, hey, we are gonna fund your PhD, five of you, give us a roadmap how we can do this. That's what Americans use us to do as PSU students. They throw the problems to you, you come up with a solution. The government runs with it, and America keeps getting better. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. But one thing I'll tell us, it is time for Africa, it is time for Nigeria to run on numbers. We do so much guesswork, and that is the reason why we are underperforming. Thank you, and have a very wonderful conference. Bye-bye. Thank you.